Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. Ever since the beginning of time, it seems that we've been enamored by the stars that fill the night sky. We know that some cultures worship the stars as gods, and others use them to simply mark the changing of seasons. Other cultures saw them as a way to navigate the globe, and, well, we know the wise men consulted the stars and learned about the birth of the king in Bethlehem. It's impossible for us to trace back to the time when people actually started looking up and taking note of the familiar patterns that were formed by these points of light in the nighttime sky. But almost every culture has writings that refer to the stars, whether those writings are scratched on the wall of a cave or put into digital form that we can access on our phones. We've long had a fascination with the stars that illuminate the nighttime sky. Over the last two weeks, we've been in a section of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi where he takes the time to talk about not only our relationship with God, but how our relationship with God should play into the relationship that we have with one another. In Philippians 2 verse 12, he writes that we must continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. When we talked about that part of the passage, we discussed that Paul's not teaching us that we're responsible to earn our own salvation, but that we're already recipients of salvation. It's a gift from God, and now we have a personal responsibility to live our lives in such a way that our salvation is evident to everyone around us. We discussed that we work out our salvation by studying the scriptures and being devoted in prayer to the point that we're filled with the Holy Spirit And then we show the world how a child of God should live. Last week we noticed that Paul teaches one of the ways that we work out our salvation is found in verse 14 where he says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Paul was Jewish, and he was the student of the Rabbi Gamaliel. So he understood the history of his people, and he knew that even though the Jewish people were God's chosen, they were not the most appreciative people. All throughout the Old Testament, we see that God pours out his blessing and his mercy on the children of Israel, and they're not really content with that. They would often grumble or murmur against God. And instead of being a shining city set on a hill that would serve as an example to all of the other nations, the children of Israel found themselves destitute and servants of godless people. I think we can understand how Paul would see the church in light of the children of Israel. The Israelites were brought out of Egypt. They escaped death through the Passover. God was with them and led them. He led them straight to the promised land. But because of their grumbling, their arguing, and their apparent lack of trust in God, a whole generation perished in the wilderness. The generations that came behind them didn't fare a whole lot better. They seemed to like to carry on the family tradition of murmuring and complaining about God and everything that God was trying to accomplish through them. But now, Paul understands God's doing a new thing. Jesus has once again come and saved his people from slavery and death. Jesus has come, he died on a cross, he's been resurrected, he has ascended to sit at the right hand of God, and Paul wants to make sure that we don't make the same mistake that the children of Israel made. I think I can hear Paul continuing to hope that Unlike the Jews, the new church gets it right. That's why Paul says one more thing in this section that I want to draw your attention to. In verse 15, Paul writes, Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. A part of working out our salvation is that you and I both have a personal responsibility to shine like the stars in the nighttime sky. God has allowed us to live in the middle of a culture that is twisted and corrupt. Our world is turned upside down to the point that we often celebrate depravity and perversion. 
The people that we set on pedestals, men and women, live lives that are contrary to God. Rick Warren says that we live in a culture that has three basic rules. The first rule of the culture is hedonism, or another word for that would be seeking out pleasure. We live in a culture that is enamored with this desire for pleasure. If it feels good, you should do it. Chase after it. Give whatever you have to give to achieve the things that give you pleasure. The Bible calls it the lust of the flesh. Our world believes that personal pleasure should be pursued at all costs, even if it causes someone else heartache and pain. The Hebrew writer says that there is pleasure in the sin, but just for a season. The pleasure that our world chases after is fleeting, and it only causes us to constantly chase after the next big thing, the next experience that we think will bring us the pleasure that we want. But at the end, we discover that we're never really fulfilled. We're just filled with guilt and shame. The second rule of the world is the rule of materialism. There's this strong belief that possessions are the most important thing in life. If if I want to be truly happy, I need a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger TV, a bigger bank account. And the truth is, it's not just enough to own something. I have to have the biggest, the brightest, the newest. If we want to be truly happy, just like pleasure, what we discover is that there's always something else we need, and we're never able to fill the hole in our lives with enough stuff that will bring us the peace we're longing for. The third rule of of our culture is the rule of narcissism. This has everything to do with our pride and our status. It's this unquenchable desire to have other people think that I'm the most important person in the room. That's why when we talk, we constantly try to impress people with our knowledge or our experiences or even the way we dress. That's why we have to have the last word, the best story, and everybody's attention. And when somebody comes along and they're funnier or they took a better vacation or they have a better understanding, we can't find it in ourselves to be happy for them. We can't support them. We just dry up in our jealousy. Now you understand, these three things are not new. These are the same three things that Satan used in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve, that Satan used with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, and that Satan uses every day of your life. But we're supposed to live differently. The church, individual Christians, are supposed to live our lives in such a way that we shine the light of hope to a world that desperately needs it. Paul is calling you personally to live your life as a sign of God's beauty in a world that has done so much to deface it. He's calling us to live our lives in a way that when people see you, they see you as a sign that's pointing to the new life found in God. Life that is needed in a world that only knows about death. Your love, peace, and joy are supposed to shine as bright as light against the darkness of our world. In essence, we're not supposed to be like the dark world we live in. We're called to shine in the darkness. I've noticed that shining like a star has two basic requirements. First, it requires that we live differently from the culture that surrounds us. You know, light is most useful in a dark place. If I were to light a candle in this brightly lit room, the candle wouldn't have a whole lot of effect. But if I were to light that same candle in a room that's pitch dark, then it'd be really easy to recognize that candle because the light from the candle is in direct opposition to the darkness. All throughout scriptures, we see that God calls his people to live differently from the world. When he first called Israel to be his people, he instructed them to Not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live or like the people of Canaan where I'm taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. In fact, God even gives the Israelites over 600 different laws as a way to distinguish them from the unbelieving nations. It was a way to to give them to be holy because the Lord our God is holy. In very much the same way, Paul's emphasizing God's call for us to live differently from the world so that we'll stand out. 
We live in a culture that is perverse, ungodly, and full of sin. Paul's reminding us that you were called to be different, to stand out. And just hanging in a community of Christians, there's some benefit for that, but just for a small amount of time. I mean, we come together to love one another, support one another, encourage, forgive one another. But nowhere in the text, in the Bible, are we called to live in a little holy huddle where the saved people just get together. We're supposed to go out and shine like lights in the darkness. We're supposed to be intentionally different in the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we react. Paul's reminding us that we are called to live a life that is unmistakably different from the world around us, to be holy like our God is holy. Today, if you believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation, then you have a personal responsibility to live like light in the darkness. And the truth is, the darkness is watching us. They're aware of us. And even the people that are living in the darkness, people that don't believe in God, hold us to a greater standard. Think about it this way. If you were to go to McDonald's and the guy at the register overcharges you or the guy in the back making your hamburger messes up while making your food, you would never think to blame Ronald McDonald. You would never refuse to eat a hamburger ever again. Yet, when we refuse to live like stars shining in the night, the people that live in the darkness are quick to blame our holy God. They blame God for our refusal to shine. So Paul encourages us to shine by living differently than the culture around us. The second requirement is that we have to pierce the darkness and overtake it. One of the wonderful things about light is that it always overpowers the darkness and drives it away. By its very nature, light always overcomes the darkness. Even a small candle can dispel overwhelming darkness. Paul is calling you to make a drastic difference in your community by shining a light into the darkness. And if you're not living in such a way that you're making a difference in the world around you, that should be a huge warning sign that something is wrong with your spiritual well-being. You're not healthy. A few years ago, I was attending a lectureship, and I chose to go to a class that was being led by Randy Harris. In that class, I took some notes, and one of the notes I wrote that, that Randy was talking about how healthy churches and healthy Christians naturally make an impression on their communities. But I also wrote down in my notes a question that Randy asked. He said, is the reason that the church is not making a huge impact on our community because there's too much world in the church or because there's too little church in the world? If we're going to take Paul's illustration of shining like a star seriously, then we have to acknowledge that we are being called to live our lives in such a way that we overcome and overwhelm the darkness. Maybe it would be a better way for us to ask the question, are you living out your faith in a way that would cause others to notice the light in your life? My fear is that in the church we've become so accustomed to Christianity that it's just another way to describe our personal preferences. You know, I'm a Ford guy, I'm a Chevy guy, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Christian. And instead of my relationship with Christ being the driving force in my life, it merely becomes another adjective that people use to describe me. Living like a shining star changes who we are from the inside out. Paul would later write to the Christians in Rome that we are to be transformed from the inside out by the renewing of our minds. And then if you go down a little farther in Romans chapter 12, he describes what that looks like. He says, love others well and don't hide behind a mask. Love authentically. Despise evil. Pursue what is good as if your life depends on it. Live in true devotion to one another, loving each other as sisters and brothers. Be first to honor others by putting them first. Do not slack in your faithfulness and hard work. Let your spirit be on fire, bubbling up and boiling over as you serve the Lord. Do not forget to rejoice, for hope is always just around the corner. Hold up through the hard times that are coming and devote yourself to prayer. 
Share what you have with the saints so that they lack nothing. Take every opportunity to open your life and home to others. Paul is calling you to a way of life, not a demographic, not a description, but a life change that is not just radically different from our present culture, but a life that actually changes our culture. You've been called to be a follower of Jesus, and that's not just for your benefit. That's for the benefit of your culture and for our world at large. Our world is in desperate need of light. We can't respond to our culture's greatest needs simply by gathering in a building, singing a few songs, saying a few prayers, and then just going on our merry way. We have to live like shining stars seven days a week. We have to make the choice to be relentless in our love for our community. Your relationship with Christ must invade the darkness. And I understand there's some risks involved with that. But truly, love is worth the risk. Those of you that are married, you understood that your spouse could take advantage of you. They could abuse you. They could hurt you. But you chose to love them because you believed that love was worth the risk. Those of you that are parents, you knew that your children could be obstinate and hard-headed. You knew that they could make horrible choices, that they could get in trouble, that they could take advantage of your love for them. And yet you still chose to have children because you believed that love was worth the risk. As a matter of fact, every relationship that you have is risky. And no matter how many times you're disappointed or hurt or wounded, you continue to reach out to others because you believe that love is worth the risk. You do that because that's what you see our Heavenly Father do. When God made the decision to create the heavens and the earth, when He decided to give us the ability to choose how we would respond to Him, He knew that there was a big risk involved in creating us. He just thought that love was worth the risk. That's why if we're going to be His people, we have to love relentlessly like He does. There's a huge risk in opening yourself up, but At the end of the day, love is willing to take the risk because we believe that everyone created in the image of God deserves to be loved. We believe everyone created in His image deserves the opportunity to see the light of His love and His mercy and His grace. The only thing that makes sense in this life is to treat the people created in the image of God the exact same way that God treats you, with relentless love. We have the opportunity to gather at a table today because God made the decision to love us first. And it's a great, relentless love. As we take the bread and we take the cup, we hear Paul's teaching that we have to live like stars shining in the darkness. You have been given the beautiful opportunity to gather and worship God. And it would be a shame for you to walk away from God's presence and to keep quiet. If your relationship with God stops at the door of your house or a church building, well, you're refusing to let your light shine. When we leave the tables today, you'll go out into a community that's confused and lost in its own darkness. You need to hear the call of Paul and the call of God to go out as stars so that you can point people to Jesus. As you celebrate this memorial feast, you're being called to be a star in the sky, a navigational aid for our community that really has no idea which way to turn. You are being called to point people to our great and awesome loving God, the God that not only loved you enough to create you, but the God who loved you enough to create the stars.